we should have, um, I believe it is three more days. Yeah, for Order of the Phoenix. Tonight's, today's the 29th, the 3rd, and the 5th. So, what I'm going to attempt to do is essentially cover about a third of the model in each of these days. Um, I say attempt because I don't really think I'll be able to do that, but we'll um, see what happens. Because, I mean, there is actually a lot in each of these thirds uh, that I would like to um, discuss. Okay, beginning with chapter one. <clears throat> now, if you remember, um, in book four, we saw Sirius talk with Harry, Ron, and Hermione about what it was like before when Voldemort was rising to power. And he describes essentially mass kidnappings, torturings of muggles and wizards, etc. Fear and panic everywhere. So when this book opens, we don't see that. And Harry's wondering why, which is why he's sneaking about trying to find information from the news, from publications and such. And he doesn't, he doesn't know what's going on. Bottom of page seven. He thinks he hears a magical sound. And Vernon kicks him out of the house, tells him to go away. And we're told perhaps it hadn't been a magical sound after all. Perhaps he was so desperate for the tiniest sign of contact from the world to which he belonged that he was simply overreacting to perfectly ordinary noises. Harry felt a dull, sinking sensation in his stomach. And before he knew it, the feeling of hopelessness that had plagued him all summer rolled over him once again. So, summer has come and largely gone, and he's filled with a sense of hopelessness. And then we get a long description about how his next day would begin. He'd get up at 5 a.m. so that he could pay the owl for the daily profit. He would scan the daily profit, or at least the first few pages. And he, we get snippets of letters he's received from Hermione and Sirius and Ron and such. And we're told then at the end of page 9. In the meantime... He had nothing to look forward to but another restless, disturbed night. Because even when he escaped nightmares about Cedric, he had unsettling dreams about long, dark corridors, all finishing in dead ends and locked doors, which he had supposed had something to do with the trapped feeling he had when he was awake. Okay? Trapped at the Dursleys. The injustice of it all, the next paragraph, welled up inside him so that he wanted to yell with Fury. I mean, Harry is, man, he is tight. He is wound tight like a drum. If it hadn't been for him, nobody would even have known Voldemort was back. And he just goes on and on. He's done all this stuff. He doesn't get any recognition. He doesn't get any praise. He doesn't get all this stuff. And we get adjectives describing him like furious and writhing with anger. So he leaves the house, goes on for a walk up the street, goes to a nearby park, and he sees Dudley and his friends, page 11. And here he's sitting on a swing, and he's thinking, come on, Dudley, turn around, look at me, I'm right here. And he knows if Dudley's friends saw him, they'd want to have a go at it, meaning they'd want to beat him up. He wouldn't want to lose face, Dudley that is, wouldn't want to lose face in front of the gang, but he'd be terrified of provoking Harry. It would be really fun to watch Dudley's dilemma, to taunt him, watch him, with him powerless to respond. And if any of the others tried hitting Harry, Harry was ready, he had his wand, let him try. He'd love to vent some of his frustration on the boys who had once made his life hell. 
But they don't turn around, and Harry doesn't call them. Notice the language that's used. This is pretty important. Harry mastered the impulse to call after them. Okay? This impulse, this, this deep desire to go, you, I'm over here, come have a whack. Okay? Seeking a fight was not a smart move. He must not use magic. He would be risking expulsion again, going back to book two. Okay? So, he mastered this impulse, self-control. Okay? Dudley's gang's voices die down. They all split. He hears one of them call Dudley, a couple of them call Dudley Big D. Bottom of page 12. And Harry kind of saddles up beside Dudley as they're walking home and says, Hey, Big D. Oh, it's you. So how long have you been Big D then? then? And they talk a little bit. What is Harry doing? He's provoking. Okay. Notice, middle of that page. Dudley said nothing. The effort of keeping himself from hitting Harry seemed to be demanding all his self-control. So Harry mastered his impulses. He practiced self-control. Now we see Dudley doing it. Do we ever see Dudley anywhere else in the previous four novels practice self-control? No. Especially when it comes to an opportunity to hit Harry. It's, you know, let him swing. All right? So... Here he asks, who you been beating up tonight? Another 10-year-old? Dudley says he wasn't 10, blah, 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 blah. Bottom of that page. A muscle was twitching in Dudley's jaw. Is that ever a good sign? It gave Harry enormous satisfaction to know how furious he was making Dudley. He felt as though he was siphoning off his own frustration into his cousin, the only outlet he had. Remember when Dumbledore explained to Harry about the pensive? How you can get so full of thoughts and emotions, your mind just feels crammed. And so at times like that, he likes to siphon those thoughts off and put them in a pensive. Well, Harry didn't understand what Dumbledore was talking about. But notice this. It's as though Harry is using Dudley as his pensive. He's doing what? siphoning off his own frustration and giving it to Dudley. Okay? Remember back at the end of book two when Harry and, Vo and um, Dumbledore were talking and Dumbledore says, the night that he gave you that scar, I'm afraid that Dumbledore, that Voldemort transferred some of his powers to you. And Harry reinterprets that. And he says, Voldemort put a bit of himself into me? Dumbledore says, I think so. What's Harry doing here? It, well, yeah, but it's not his powers. It's his frustration, his passion, his anger. And notice what Harry takes from that. Satisfaction. Great satisfaction. Harry takes pleasure in causing what for Dudley? Displeasure. Pain. Frustration. Is that any different? That is, Harry's taking pleasure in Dudley's displeasure. Is that any different, really, from what the Death Eaters were doing when they were putting the Robertses up in the air at the Quidditch World Cup? No, it's not. So why is Harry doing this? This is unlike Harry, isn't it? It's unlike the Harry we saw in books one through three and almost all of book four. Kind of, kind of, like, uh, kind of, like, kind of losing his innocence? Kind of like there's a big Baltimore coming Okay. Follow up on that. It's like there's, it's like that piece of Voldemort, where it's like that power of Voldemort is rising in Harry. 
Well, why would that be? Because he's calling somebody else on or displays like him. Okay. It's not like they're well, Voldemort's being strong. Voldemort's back to power. Uh, and Harry's had quite a bit of contact with him. And Harry had him, especially at the end of the last book. Face to face contact. Okay. So now Voldemort is back at full power. There's a connection with there's a connection between the two, Dumbledore said. Dumbledore said, you know, when, Dumb when Voldemort is near you, your scar is going to hurt. Or when Dumbledore is what? Particularly feeling hatred really strongly, your scar is going to hurt. But what has happened between when Dumbledore said those words and now? Voldemort came back. How did he come back? Through Harry's blood. So he can now touch Harry and it doesn't hurt Voldemort. All right? So I think that something that has happened as a result of that is now when Voldemort feels really, really angry, it's not necessarily the case that Harry's head is going to feel like it's going to explode. It's that Harry's going to channel some of that anger also. So they go on down the street. Keep talking, and Dudley brings up Cedric. I hear you dreaming at night. Don't kill Cedric. Don't kill Cedric. Who's Cedric? Your boyfriend? Shut up, says Harry. Shut up, Dudley. Page 15. I'm warning you. Oh, come and help me, Dad. Mom. Dudley backs into the wall, which is kind of interesting. Is Harry pushing Dudley into the wall? No, but he does have his wand out. And he's got it pointed where? Right at his heart. Harry was pointing the wand directly at Dudley's heart. Harry could feel 14 years hatred of Dudley pounding in his veins. In other words, his heart is racing. And it's not just racing, because your heart can race and not pound hard. It's boom, boom, like a hammer on an anvil. What he wouldn't give to strike now to jinx Dudley so thoroughly he'd have to crawl home like an insect. Struck dumb, sprouting feelers. All right? And what happens? It suddenly gets dark. Page 16, second paragraph. Harry thinks, did I do magic? He'd been resisting as hard as he could. Notice, though, he's resisting doing magic while not resisting what? Just letting that passion fly. Just letting all that anger and hatred out. I mean, it's like that scene in the, uh, the third original Star Wars. Luke is battling Darth Vader. And what does the Emperor do? Yes, good. I can feel the hatred. Let it course through your veins and you will be fine. You know? That's what Luke's doing here. Or that's what Harry's doing here. But the darkness pressed on his eyes like a weightless veil. Okay. What is the darkness caused by? Take that word veil, rearrange the letters. Evil. Like a weightless evil. That's a pretty good description of the Dementors. Right? Because they don't walk on the ground, first of all. They float. They hover. And Harry realizes what it is. Dudley feels what's going on. He can't see them because he's a muggle. Muggles can't see Dementors. They can feel their presence. Okay? Dudley's whimpering. Huh, I'll tell Dad. Okay, he's the Southeast boxing champion. He's not one to usually, at this point in his life, to go running to daddy. So what's going on in Dudley's mind? He is scared, you know what? Okay? And it's like he's regressing as a child. Dudley runs off after he smacks Harry. Harry tells him to keep his mouth shut. Whatever you do, keep your mouth shut. And Harry sees the Dementor. 
He tries the Expecto Patronum charm, doesn't do much. Tries it again, doesn't do much. Page 18, think something happy. But there's no happiness in him. Has he had any happiness all summer long? No. Did he have any happiness at the end of the previous school year? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, he won a thousand galleons. Big deal. He gave it to Fred and George. The Dementor's icy fingers were closing and closing on his throat. The high-pitched laughter was growing louder and louder. He hasn't even blacked out yet, and he's hearing Voldemort. And a voice spoke inside his head, Bow to death, Harry. It might even be painless, I would not know. And he thinks, I've never seen Ron and Hermione again. It's seeing their faces that gives him the spark he needs to do a proper expecto patronum. Okay? It's his love for them that does this. And his stag patronus knocks that Dementor away, and he tells it where to go to get the one on Dudley. Okay? Mrs. Fig shows up when Harry puts his wand away. Don't put it away, boy. What if there are more of them around? Oh, I'm going to kill my Douglas Fletcher. And so Harry's little world kind of, you know, explodes at that point when he finds out baddie old Arabella Fig is a witch. The woman who's babysat him for 13, 14 years. Harry, what? Right. So, she and Mundungus Fletcher help Harry back, well, Mundungus briefly, helps Harry back to Privet Drive. And Harry helps Dudley across the threshold. Vernon threatens him. Harry says, get out of the way, page 28, or I'm going to jinx you. No, well, you can't do that. Okay. Harry's like, I've been kicked out of the madhouse, so don't threaten me. Owls keep coming, delivering letters. Okay. Page 29. Harry, Dumbledore's going to sort it all out. What did that mean? How much power did Dumbledore have to override the Minister of Magic? Was there a chance he might be allowed back to Hogwarts? A small shoot of hope burgeoned in Harry's chest. Keep in mind, he's been hopeless all summer long. And he's thinking, how am I supposed to refuse to surrender my wand and not use magic? All right. So, Harry, page 31, finally says to the Dursleys, it wasn't me that is that's causing Dudley's discomfort. It was a couple of Dementors. A couple of, what's this called, Wallop? Says Vernon. Harry, notice how Rowling prints it. Dementors, like idiot. Okay. Two of them. And what the ready other Dementors? They guard the wizarding prison of Azkaban, says Aunt Petunia. Harry's world's just turned upside down and inside out at the very same time. Two seconds ringing silence. How do you know? And she says, I heard that awful boy telling her about them years ago. She says, jerkily. Why jerkily? Scared. Yeah, she's very scared. Why else? It's, it's almost like, I'm not saying she is. It's almost like she's a puppet here. Like she's reliving something. The awful boy. We find out later who that is. Here, before we read books six and seven, we assume it's James when they start dating or going out. Okay? We find out later it's not James. It's somebody else. And when she says years ago, it's probably... When Lily and Petunia were around the ages of 10 and 11. Okay. So, 20 years ago. Okay. 
because the Dursleys are early 30s. Lily's, uh, Petunia's like a year younger than Lily was. So she remembers a conversation her older sister had with some boy decades ago. Harry, if you mean my mom and dad, notice he interprets that awful boy to mean that. But she ignores him. She is stunned. She is flustered. And we get this wonderful little paragraph. Harry was stunned. Except for one outburst years ago, in the course of which Aunt Petunia had screamed that Harry's mother had been a freak, he'd never heard her mention her sister. That was his first year when they were at the hut on the rock in the sea. He was astounded that she had remembered this scrap of information about the magical world for so long, when she usually put all her energies into pretending it didn't exist. In other words, just as Harry must master his impulses and practice self-control, what does that little par paragraph tell us about Petunia? She has to consciously work at what? Repressing. Louder? Repressing. Repressing. Okay. Or not believing. In magic. Or another way of putting it, not believing. In the invisible world. Why, why suggest this? I was just teaching Philosopher's Stone to my other class this morning. We're not doing all of the Harry Potter things. And we, we did the Mirror of Erison. And something struck me for the first time. And I've been teaching these things for years. And I've read them many, many times. And it's the scene when Harry looks in the mirror... And when he first sees his mother, we're told she's smiling and waving at him. What does the fact of her waving suggest? Or what does that show? Familiarity. Familiarity? She sees him. It's not merely Harry looking in and seeing the deepest desire of his heart, which is seeing himself surrounded by his family. When he looks in that mirror and he sees those faces, he turns around, there's nobody there. He puts his hand behind him to see if he could feel, we're told, those invisible people. Okay? She sees him in waves. And then, next description we get, she's smiling and crying. Why is she crying? Because I think she sees him doing this. He's trying to reach out. He's trying to get to her. And he can't. There is something separating them. Which is why James then puts his arm around her and comforts her. What is that showing? Just like, I think, those echoes with the wand at the end of book four... What Harry is seeing in that mirror is real. It's not something that he is projecting. It's like the mirror has done what? It's opened up this. Or, to use language from the end of this book, it pulls aside the veil that separates this world from this world. What does Dumbledore tell Harry at the end of book one? To the well-organized mind, death is what? But the next great adventure. Death is not the end. Okay? If you're an atheist, you think death is the end. That's it. You die. Your body rots. Your atoms and molecules 
dissipate. What you think of as your consciousness isn't really real. It is merely electrical, electrochemical reactions going on in the brain. What you think of as your soul doesn't exist. It will cease. Dumbledore says, uh-uh. When you die, all that is merely is an opening to what? Another kind of existence. Another, maybe, level of existence. Okay? Uncle Vernon opens his mouth and closes it again. Does it again? Uh, so these actually exist. The Dementia what's it? And Petunia nods her head. What does her nodding her head mean? She is acknowledging this. What did they tell Hagrid when they were on the hut? In the hut, on the rock, in the sea. We swore we'd stamp this nonsense out of him. But what if he can't stamp the nonsense out? What if the nonsense reaches out and bites you? Okay. So, Harry gets another letter. Tells him I've got to go to a meeting, a hearing, about whether or not I'm going to get kicked out of school and such. All right. And he keeps getting letters, <clears throat> page 35. He starts to get pissed off. His temper was rising again. Wasn't anybody going to say, well done for fighting off two Dementors single-handedly? Mr. Weasley and Sirius were acting as though he'd misbehaved. And they were saving their tellings off until they could ascertain how much damage had been done. Harry's thinking, what? I saved my life. I saved Dudley's life. Okay. So, Vernon wants to know, how did these dementi, what's it, or dementoids, he uses a variety of words, get here, Harry? No idea. And then he says, well, okay. He must have sent them. Who? Lord Voldemort. Wait, wait. Hold on. I've heard that name. That's the chap who murdered my parents. Page 37. But he's gone. The, the giant bloke said so. He's bad, says Harry. Now look at this paragraph. It felt very strange to be standing here in Aunt Petunia's surgically clean kitchen. What does the surgically clean imply? That there was no mistakes. Okay, no mistakes. What else? Why do you have a surgically clean operating room? What does that mean? No bacteria. No. no bacteria. In other words, nothing invisible, nothing that can't be seen is going to harm you in this room. It's sterile, which means dead. There's no life. Okay. Beside the top of the range fridge, meaning only the best for the Dursleys. And the widescreen television in the kitchen? How many people you know have a widescreen TV in their kitchens? And talking calmly of Lord Voldemort to Uncle Vernon. The arrival of the Dementors in Little Winging seemed to have caused a breach in the great invisible wall that divided the relentlessly non-magical world of Privet Drive and the world beyond. Here's Harry's world. This is the world beyond. This is the world of muggles. And what has just happened? Yeah. Or to put it another way, Here's the world beyond. Here's the world of the Dursleys, muggles, everyday reality that we're aware of. And that's what's happened. So that now, this is doing what? It's bleeding into what we experience here, right? 
And we can skip for a moment and go to the beginning of book six. Because what do we see at the beginning of book six? All hell is breaking loose in book six. You have murders that are unexplained. You have abductions that are unexplained. You have bridges collapsing that is unexplained. You have hurricanes, it's thought, in the west country of England. You don't get hurricanes in England. It's too far north. Okay? Well, why? Because of this. And we see the Minister of Magic meet the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister is taught. He says, wait, wait a second. You mean to say, I'm having to deal with my problems because of the problems in your world? And the Minister of Magic's like, duh, <laughs> didn't you understand that? Okay. Harry's two lives had somehow become fused and everything had been turned upside down. The Dursleys are asking for details about the magical world and Mrs. Fig knew, er knew Albus Dumbledore. Dementors were soaring around little winging and he might never go back to Hogwarts? Petunia. Back? She hears Harry say, Voldemort's back. And she's like, what? She was looking at Harry as she had never looked at him before. And all of a sudden, for the very first time in his life, Harry fully appreciated that Aunt Petunia was his mother's sister. It's like it had never hit him before. All he knew was that he was not the only person in the room who had an inkling of what Lord Voldemort being back might mean. Aunt Petunia had never in her life looked at him like that before. Her large, pale eyes, so unlike her sister's, were not narrowed in dislike or anger. They were wide and fearful. The furious pretense that Aunt Petunia had maintained all Harry's life. Here's the pretense that there was no magic and no world other than the world she inhabited with Uncle Vernon, seemed to have fallen away. Meaning, I think, if you take Vernon and Petunia to be materialists, only things that are real are the things that can be measured and evaluated. Seen heard, tasted, touched, or smelled. Whether you have to use the finest measuring equipment possible, those are the only things that are real. This is what the Dursleys want to be. And what Harry comes to realize is they aren't really. What's the opposite of materialists? Immaterialists? I don't know. Spiritualists? In other words, people who apply, there is, to quote Hamlet, more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. That there is more than just what can be measured or quantified. Okay? Think back for a moment. Book four, we're told, Voldemort's rise to power began essentially 11 years previously. And okay, we're told that in book four. Um, no, I'll take that back. Voldemort's rise to power began uh, about 11 years before Harry's birth. When would that have been? This is when uh, Lily started school. Yeah. Same year Lily and James started school. So Voldemort's rise to power begins about the same time as Lily goes off to Hogwarts. Lily's whole magical life 
from when she finds out she's a witch, when she gets that letter from Hogwarts, if not before because of that awful boy, okay, corresponds with Voldemort's rise to power. She goes through school. She meets and marries James. They have Harry, and then they die. Okay. She has about a 10-year lifespan from when she discovers she's magical, or at the least, when she goes off to Hogwarts. She has 10 years to live. Okay. What that kind of implies is that during that 10-year span, and just before their death, she and Petunia are still in contact. Okay? Definitely the seven years that she's at Hogwarts, because she comes home every summer, comes home every year. So when Harry has this sudden epiphany, this sudden realization, that Petunia really is my mom's sister. It's this realization She's been introduced to the magical world. She's, she's not like Vernon in that sense. She grew up with her sister being magical. Vernon never did. Vernon probably didn't meet um, Lily until about the time he and Petunia at least started dating, got married. Probably did not know Petunia and James well because of how soon they died. So, he says, wait, well, hold on. Lord Voldy, the one who murdered your parents, he's back. And he's sending dismembers after you. Harry, yes, looks like it. I see. Out! <laughs> and wants to kick him out of the house. All right? And he almost succeeds. Until Petunia gets what? Page 40. A howler. Okay. What's the difference between a letter and a howler? Yeah, Ron gets a howler in book two. Because he and Harry fly the flying forward Anglia to school, and Mrs. Weasley sends a howler. And Ron knows what it is. And Neville says, oh man, you better open it quick. You don't want it to... Because if you let it burst on its own, it's like it gets magnified. Okay? Four words. Remember my last, Petunia. Petunia feels like she might faint. She sinks into the chair beside Dudley, her face in her hands. Uncle Vernon, I, I, I don't, he doesn't understand. Well, what's the remember my last? We find out later, this is Dumbledore who sends the howler. What was the last? It's the letter he leaves with Harry on the doorstep, explaining everything. Meaning, explaining not only why he leaves Harry on the doorstep, but explaining the powerful, magical charm that resides not in Vernon's blood, but in Petunia's blood, that protects Harry. Petunia does not have to love Harry for him to be protected. It would help, as we will hear later on. So Petunia says, no, he has to stay. Okay? So the advance guard shows up. They kind of trick the um, Dursleys, thinking they've won some award. And so they leave, and Harry gets introduced to a variety of new witches and wizards. Okay. Lupin shows up. Sirius is there. We meet Nymphadora Tonks, a brand new Auror. We see the real Mad-Eye Moody. Okay. Um, who else is there? Daedalus Diggle is there, page 49. Kingsley Shacklebolt, tall black wizard. Elphias Doge, Daedalus Diggle again. Emmeline Vance, Sturgis Podmore. Some of these people are going to be dead 
by the end of the next book. Okay? So they've come to take Harry away. In Moody, page 54, disillusions Harry. Harry, you need to what? Disillusionment charm. Lupin says you've got an invisibility cloak, but it won't stay on while we're flying. This will disguise you better. Here you go. Hits Harry on the top of his head with his wand, and Harry feels as though Moody had smashed an egg there. What's she talking about? You know, that old game where you can go up to somebody and do that, okay? Or literally smash an egg, and it feels like it's washing all over you. And it turns Harry invisible. So they go off to the headquarters of the Phoenix, which is Sirius's house. Okay. Number 12, what's the name of the street? I want to hear one of you pronounce it rather than me. Grimald. Grim old. Grim old place. It is a grim old place. It's a battered old house. Okay? So, here he goes inside. We're going to skip some. Um, we see the house elf heads on the wall and such. Page 63. He gets inside. He meets up with Ron and Hermione, and we're told. Um, as soon as he f sees them, he feels good. But page 63, right about in the middle of the page, Harry's like, uh, you know, I, I wanted answers, and you guys didn't write. <laughs> Ron, we wanted to give them to you, mate. Harry, yeah, well, Hermione's already said, you know, that you swore not to tell me. The warm glow that had flared inside him at the sight of his two best friends was extinguished as something icy flooded the pit of his stomach. What's the something icy? Okay. Notice, the warm glow that had flared inside him. What enabled him to create the Patronus? Side of the faces. Yeah. His love for Ron and Hermione. So he sees them again when he arrives at Grimmel Place. And his, his chest just kind of gets buoyed up by them. But now, boom, it's like ice. Why? Because he rather felt that he'd like Ron and Hermione to leave him alone. Why? Because he's been alone all summer and he hasn't. He hasn't been in on things. He's been left outside. Okay. So what does he start doing? Page 65. All caps. All caps and texting means what? Okay. He is blowing his stack here. And Ron and Hermione are like, you know, <laughs> Harry, we're not your enemies. Okay. So they go on downstairs, and page 70, we find out Percy and Arthur Weasley had a big row. Percy's moved out of the house, which Harry cannot believe. He finds out Dumbledore is no longer held in a high standing. Okay? The Ministry of Magic is working against him. And page 72, Harry gets more information about Percy and Arthur. And Ron says, Percy said Dad was an idiot to run around with Dumbledore, that Dumbledore was heading for big double trouble, and Dad was going to go down with him, and that he, Percy, knew where his loyalty lay, and it was with the ministry. And if Mom and Dad were going to become traitors to the ministry, he was going to make sure everyone knew he didn't belong to our family anymore. Packed his bags the same night. Harry, but Percy must know Voldemort's back. He's not stupid. 
He must know your mom and dad wouldn't risk everything without proof. Harry, yeah, well, your name got uh, run. Your name got dragged into it, too. Hermione, Percy takes the Daily Prophet seriously. And Harry's like, what are you talking about? I've been reading the Daily Prophet. Hermione, um, have you been reading it thoroughly? Notice she's kind of uh, a little tentative about asking that question. Well, Harry, not cover to cover. I mean, if they were going to report everything, anything, it'd be headline news, wouldn't it? What does this tell us about Harry's investigative abilities? A little shallow. He's a Donald Trump kind of a reader. You know, if it's important, it's going to be in big, bold letters on the face of the... Rather than getting through and reading the meat of what's going on. If you want to find out what's going on in the United States, don't read the front page of the New York Times. Or the Wall Street Journal. Open into the middle to find out what's going on. I'd say personally, don't read the New York Times at all, but you know, that's me. Okay? So, Hermione said, you need to read it cover to cover to pick up what's been going on. Harry, but I'd have seen, mm, not if you've not been reading all of it. Okay? So what does he find out? Daily Prophet has made out that Dumbledore is trying to get Fudge's job and is crazy, and that Harry is crazy, crazy. Okay? So, what else do we find out about Dumbledore? He's been sacked from the Wisengamot, which was that trial or that group of judges that Harry saw when he went into the pensive. Okay? And we get to the next chapter, the Order of the Phoenix. They have their big meal. All the order is there, except for Dumbledore and Snape, and a few others. And Mrs. Weasley says, all right, children, time for bed. Serious. Not just yet, Molly. He looks at Harry and says, I'm surprised at you. That first thing you do is start asking questions about Voldemort. Harry, I did. I asked Ron and Hermione. But I'm not we're not allowing the order, so and Mrs. Weasley. Right, quite right, too young. Sitting bolt upright in her chair, fists clenched upon it, you know, stiff, uptight lady, in other words. Harry, uh, serious. Since when did someone have to be in the order of the Phoenix to ask questions? Okay, so what's going on between Sirius and Molly Weasley? Okay, about what, ultimately? Telling or informing Harry. Okay. What's a bit of what's going on? Okay, keep going. What is Molly Weasley being? A mother. What is Sirius being? Is he being a godfather? Okay. A little more than that. He's trying to be like an equal. Okay, he's trying to be an equal or a friend to Harry. What else? He's being a spur, an instigator. He's kind of prodding Harry along. He's thinking of Harry the way he, Sirius, would have thought of James. You don't just sit there, right? I mean, come on. He's, he's instigating. Okay? Molly is thinking solely of, I've got to protect my hens or my chicks. I've got to protect the little ones. What did Dumbledore tell not only Harry, but then the entire school at the end of the previous school year? Harry has done what? Shouldered a grown man's burden. What does that kind of imply? He's a man. He's a man. He can take it. Right? What did Moody tell them at the beginning, the false Moody, at the beginning of the school year? Dumbledore thinks you're ready to hear this. Dumbledore thinks you need to know what it's going to be like. Right? So, 
Molly and Arthur, uh, Molly and, and Ceres kind of go back and forth. And she says, bottom 88, he's not a member of the order. He's only 15 and Ceres. And he's dealt with as much as most in the order and more than some. What does Ceres mean? Who was in the previous incarnation of the Order of the Phoenix? Mundungus Fletcher, Arabella Fig, a bunch of dead people, <laughs> Mad Eye Moody, Remus Lupin, Sirius Black, James and Lily Potter. What about the Weasleys? Nope. They weren't in it. Sirius is saying, don't talk to me about the damn Order of the Phoenix. I know what the Order of the Phoenix is. And Harry is done, as he says, as much as most in the Order and more than some. Who does he mean, and more than some? Shut up, Molly. Sit down. No one's denying what he's done, but he's still, he's not a child. He's not an adult either. Well, what is he then? He's an adolescent in between. Really? Is an adolescent really in between? It's an interesting question. I don't think so. 14-year-old who kills somebody with a handgun is not a child. 14-year-old who beats the life out of somebody else is not a child. They know what they're doing, okay? That is an adult and ought to be tried as an adult. He's not James, Siri. See, that's what she's getting at. She's not getting at he's a child. She's getting at you're equating him with his father. What's she worried about? Where's James? Dead. She doesn't want Harry to end up that way also. Harry, I'm no, uh, serious. I'm perfectly clear who he is, thanks. I'm not sure you are. Sometimes I think you think he's your best friend. Harry, what's wrong with that? What's wrong, Harry, is that you are not your father, however much you might look like him. You're still at school, and adults responsible for you should not forget it. Seriously, like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're saying I'm an irresponsible godfather now? Meaning you've been known to act rashly, serious. And she mentions Dumbledore's instructions, okay? So Lupin intervenes and says, I think Harry should get the facts from us rather than from other sources. Kind of implying that he knows about the extendable ears, okay? And finally, Arthur chimes in because she turns to Arthur for help. Husband, defend me. And he doesn't, okay? She is able to kick Ginny off, because Ginny's a year younger. And Ginny's like, even if you send me off, Ron and Hermione will tell me everything, which they will. Okay. So, Harry, finally, page 91. Where's Voldemort? What's he doing? I've been trying to watch the Muggle News. There hasn't been anything that looks like him. No funny deaths or anything. Serious, it's because there haven't been any, not as far as we know. Okay. So they keep talking. And Harry, how do you know what his plans are? Page 92 at the bottom. Lupin, Dumbledore's got a shrewd idea. So what does Dumbledore reckon he's planning? Well, he's trying to build up his army again, blah, 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 blah. Notice, there's no information that Snape is a spy and is feeding us information, right? So we talk, they talk about how difficult it is because of the ministry's attitude. Fudge thinks Dumbledore wants to be Minister of Magic. Harry, of course he doesn't. Yeah, everybody knows that, but... Okay. So they talk about the Daily Prophet, what it is doing to discredit Harry and Dumbledore. We talk about the positions Dumbledore has been fired from, voted out of the chairmanship of the International Confederation of Wizards. That would be like voted out of being United Nations Secretary. Okay and a bunch of other things. 
And we hear, but Dumbledore doesn't really care about those. Why? Because they're just titles. And we hear that Voldemort is after some kind of weapon, at which point Molly says, that's it, enough, stop. Okay. So we get the noble and most ancient house of black, which I'm going to skip quite a bit of. They're cleaning up the house. We meet Creature, page 111. We see the big tapestry on the wall, okay. which you ever get an opportunity if you're interested in Harry Potter, you ever get an opportunity to go to London, go to, just outside London, the Warner Brothers studio tour, the real one of the Harry Potter, um, the Harry Potter Warner Brothers studio tour, which is where they have all the props for the films. The actual tapestry, because they made an actual tapestry for this, okay? It's pretty amazing. I can't stand the films. I actually, I mean, I absolutely detest the films. I had no desire whatsoever to go to this. But I went to it in 2013 because it had opened. Um, I knew a bunch of my students were going to. All of my family wanted to. Some of my kids hate the films as well as I do. And I was totally bowled over. I mean, the artwork that they just have available to look at is astounding. Some of the conceptual artwork where they have an artist do a drawing and then the drawing would become a model of something. The actual model of Hogwarts that they use for filming to get exterior shots, okay, like when you're flying in or something. The actual mock-up model of the castle is probably twice the size of this room. And... Oh, probably from the ground to the top of the tallest spire, 20 feet tall. Okay, and you walk, walk all the way around. It's like a, it's like a mountain. Okay, various lighting. It changes from like summertime to wintertime. Has snowfall, etc. I mean, people literally come around this hallway. They go into there, and I'm not kidding. Men and women burst into tears seeing this thing because of the intricacy of, of how well it's built, okay? But we see the tapestry, and what does Harry discover? Who is Sirius related to? Tonks and Weasleys and the Malfoys. Why? Because all purebloods are related. Because they had to intermarry. Okay? And what do we find on this tapestry? Names have been removed. Nymphadora's name, Tonks' name, has been burned off. Sirius's name has been burned off. His brother's name has been burned off. Okay? Uh, I'm going to skip a bunch. Go on to the Ministry of Magic. Harry goes for his hearing. He ends up late because they changed the meeting room. He goes into the hall with Mr. Weasley and he sees this, this, um, this statue. And the statue is of a wizard standing kind of like this, standing up, he's got flowing robes, it's kind of like Gilderoy Lockhart, you know, long flowing hair with the hat, holding his wand up, Drop dead gorgeous swimsuit model witch kind of next to him looking up adoringly. Okay. House elf and goblin in centaur kind of at their feet. And a small sign beside the fountain that they are sitting at or that they're standing in says, all proceeds from the Fountain of Magical Brethren will be given to St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries. Notice, from the Fountain of Magical Brethren, what does the brethren imply? Equality. Equality. Witches and wizards and house elves and goblins and centaurs living in harmony and peace. Okay? So, 
Perry gets down to his hearing. He goes through the Department of Ministries, or he hears the voice in the, essentially the elevator, say the Department of Mysteries. And he gets down to the courtroom with Mr. Weasley. Mr. Weasley has to stay outside. And here he goes in, and he immediately recognizes this room. This is the same room he had seen in um, Dumbledore's Pensive. This is the trial room. You're late. Sorry, didn't know the time had changed. That is not the Wisingamot's fault. An owl was sent to you this morning, so Harry takes his seat, and he hears Fudge. And Fudge says, page 138, are you ready? And a voice says, yes, sir. And it's a voice Harry recognizes. It's Percy. So Fudge reads off, disciplinary hearing of the 12th of August. Percy starts taking notes. Into offenses committed under the decree for the reasonable restriction of underage sorcery in the International Statute of Secrecy by Harry James Potter, blah, blah, blah. Interrogators. Notice. Interrogators. Okay. Cornelius Oswald Fudge, Minister of Magic. Amelia Susan Bones, Head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. Dolores Jane Umbridge, Senior Undersecretary to the Minister. Court Scribe Percy Ignatius Weasley. And then, witness for the defense, Harry hears a voice, Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. Every one of those names is the name of a Scottish saint. Albus Percival Wolfric Brian. Okay. Dumbledore is just the old English word for bumblebee. Dumbledore strides in, draws up another chair, literally, he draws a chair, and it appears. Okay. So, we see Harry's trial. What is Fudge attempting to do? Intimidate. Intimidate? What else? What does Fudge want out of this trial? To, um, what does every prosecutor want? Confession. A conviction. He wants Harry to be found guilty, which is why they moved the trial. Okay. Dumbledore says, yeah, I got notice mid-flight. You know, luckily I was on my way early. Dumbledore is essentially saying, I thought you'd try to pull something like this. Because they're going to try to conduct the trial so that Harry would not have any what? Witnesses, defense, <laughs> support. So he's accused for violating two restrictions. Underage sorcery or witchcraft, and witchcraft or sorcery in front of a muggle. What is Harry's defense? There were dementors. Okay? And Fudge is like, ah, ha, ha, yeah, I knew this was coming. The kid who likes to tell stories. Okay? So Dumbledore essentially says, okay, let's apply some logic to this. You don't trust Harry's opinion. You don't trust Harry saying that there were Dementors. Um, is there anybody else who can give testimony to that? There is, actually. There are two other people. Arabelle Fig. Okay. And who else? Dudley. They could bring Dudley in. Okay, but they're not going to because they'd be introducing a muggle to a magical proceeding. So they bring our Arabella Fig in. Why is she not a reliable witness? She's been living in them. Okay. Why else? That's not the real reason. That's implied. She was born at the risk of happy. Exactly. She is a squib. Born a witch, but she can't do anything. She can't do magic. She's like Argus Filch, the caretaker at Hogwarts. Okay? But she sees the wizarding world perfectly. And so she describes the movement of the Dementors. 
gets all dark, all hope, joy, love fade away. They float. Okay? So, that's pretty strong evidence there were actual Dementors. So, Dumbledore says, now we need to decide why they were there. Fudge swears all the Dementors were under the control of the Ministry of Magic. Okay? So, Dementors under control. Okay. Dementors in Surrey. So what do you have to conclude? If all the Dementors are under control, well, one other possibility. Some Dementors not under control. You only have two options. Either the Dementors were in Surrey in Little Wingy, Harry's town, because someone from the Ministry, Ministry of Magic ordered them to go there, or not all the Dementors were under the control of the Ministry of Magic, and there are rogue Dementors. Well, Fudge swears this is not possible. If this one is not possible, then the only other option is somebody ordered them there. And if that's the case, and there really were Dementors there, then Harry had every cause to use magic. And so he gets off. Free. He's not going to be expelled. Okay. And can go back to school. Um, they leave the... Harry leaves the courtroom, page 154. Sees Mr. Weasley. And he sees Fudge. They're at the ninth level corridor. Mr. Weasley breaks off in mid-sentence, bottom of 153. They had just reached the ninth level corridor. Fudge was standing a few feet away, talking to a tall man with sleek blonde hair. The second man turned at the sound of their footsteps. He breaks off in mid-conversation, too. And he looks and says, Well, well, well. Patronus Potter. Here he felt winded, as though he just walked into something heavy. Last time he looked at Lucius Malfoy, where was he? In the graveyard. In the graveyard. Minister was just telling me about your lucky escape, Potter. Snake-like, in fact. Harry, yeah, I'm good at escaping. And Arthur Weasley, too. What are you doing here, Arthur? Uh, I work here. Not here, surely. I thought you were up on the second floor. Harry, what are you doing here? Turns the tables. I don't think private matters between myself and the minister are any concern of yours, Potter. Just because you're Dumbledore's favorite boy, you must not expect the same indulgence from the rest of us. Okay. Notice, Malfoy calls him Patronus Potter. Savior Potter. What do we find out in Book 7? Harry is called the Chosen One. Okay. The Anointed One. So, Harry wonders, bottom of 155, it's Fudge under an imperious curse. And Mr. Weasley says, don't think it hadn't occurred to us, Fudge, uh, Harry, but Dumbledore thinks Fudge is acting of his own accord at the moment, which isn't a lot of comfort. Okay? So they go home, and they have a party. And... At this party, they get their um, reading list for the new school year. We find out Harry, uh, excuse me, Hermione and Ron are prefects, going to be made prefects, which really bugs Harry because he's thinking, Ron, really? Harry's thinking, should have been me. Page 167. Harry's 
angry. And he's thinking, I'm better at Quidditch, but I'm not better at anything else. Well, that's true. Ron and Hermione were with me most of the time, that is, when Harry's done dangerous things. Top of 167, but not all the time. They didn't fight Quirrell with me. They didn't take on Riddle and the Basilisk. They didn't get rid of all those Dementors. The Night Sirius escaped. They weren't in that graveyard with me. I've definitely done more. I've done more than either of them. But the small voice says, maybe Dumbledore doesn't choose prefects because they've got themselves into a load of dangerous situations. Maybe he chooses them for other reasons. Okay. Maybe Ron has something you don't. So Harry goes down to the party. And Mrs. Weasley mentions to Moody that there's a boggart upstairs. Or there's something in the upstairs. And he looks through the floor, and he says, drawing room, desk in the corner. Yep, yeah, I see it. It's a boggart. Want me to go up and get rid of it? She says, no. I'll do it myself later. Okay. What did they learn when dealing with boggarts? They can transform into what you fear. Transform into what you fear. So you need to use the ridiculous charm. And what else does Lupin say? It's really best not to go after them one on one. Okay? Because if you can get them so that they keep transforming, you get them when they're weak. But Mundungus being an, uh, excuse me, Moody being an Auror, he can handle it. Is Molly Weasley an Auror? No. Okay? So, page 173. Moody thinks he has something neat to show Harry. A picture of the old Order of the Phoenix. Found it last night when I was looking for my spare invisibility cloak. Okay, that implies he has more than one. <laughs> Seeing as Podmore hasn't had the manners to return my best one. This is Sturge's Podmore. So Moody says, there's me. There's Dumbledore, there's Dedalus Diggle, there's Marlene McKinnon. She was killed two weeks after this take was taken. That's the first death. Okay. They got her whole family. We don't know how many that means. That's Frank and Alice Longbottom. They're not dead, but they might as well be. Poor devils. There's Emmeline Vance. You've met her. She'll be dead by the end of the next book, by the way. There's Lupin, Benji Fenwick. He copped it too, and they ever found bits of him. That's four dead or maimed. Move aside there, he moves people. Edgar Bones, brother Amelia Bones. Where did Harry meet Amelia Bones? In the trial. What was one of the things that helped him get off? She said, you, you can produce a corporeal Patronus? Harry's like, what? He doesn't understand the word corporeal. A physical, you can make a, a physical Patronus. He goes, yeah. How long have you been doing it? Since third year. That's impressive magic. And Fudge says, it doesn't matter how impressive the magic is. Makes you kind of wonder whether Fudge can. Okay? So, um, Edgar Bones, her brother, was a member of the Order of the Phoenix. He got him and his family, too. He was a great wizard. Sturgis Podmore, Caradoc Dearborn, never found him. Hagrid was a member. Elphias Doge, Harry's met him. Gideon Pruitt took five Death Eaters to kill him and his brother Fabian. They are Molly Weasley's brothers. Her maiden name is Pruitt. Okay. And there's Dumbledore's brother, Aberforth. And there's Dorcas Meadows. Notice who's not in it. The Weasleys aren't in it. Okay. Neither are James and uh, Lily. I said earlier James and Lily were 
But it's almost like they were honorary members because Dumbledore was at work trying to keep them safe and protected, as was the um, Order of the Phoenix. Okay. And Harry thinks, as Moody goes on, that's supposed to make me feel good? Because look, nine of the, and I don't remember what the total number is, it's like 18 or so. Half of them are dead or insane. So what does that say about the new Order of the Phoenix? Dumbled if Voldemort is back to full power, well, what's going to happen? So Harry makes his way upstairs, and he hears Mrs. Weasley. And she's sobbing. And he goes by that room, and he sees Ron dead on the floor, Hermione dead on the floor, Bill, Charlie, Jenny, Arthur, Harry, because Mrs. Weasley can't get rid of the boggart. Harry tells her to get out of there. Lupin comes in. He says, it's just a boggart. Bottom 176. I see them dead all the time. All the time. I dream about it. Sirius comes in. Mrs. Weasley, don't, don't tell Arthur. I don't want him to know. Harry, I'm sorry. I'm not even able to get rid of a boggart. Harry, don't be stupid. She says, I'm just so worried. Half the family's in the order. It'll be a miracle if we all come through this. And Percy's not talking to us. What if we die? Her implication is, before we make up with Percy, who's going to look after Ron and Jenny? Lupin and Molly, that's enough. This isn't like the last time. The order are better prepared. We've got a head start. We know what Voldemort's up to. And she, ah! Come on, it's about time you got used to hearing it. Okay? Serious. Don't worry about Percy. He'll come around. It's a matter of time before Voldemort moves into the open. And once he does, the whole ministry is going to be begging us to forgive them. And he says, and don't worry about Ron and Jenny. You think we'd let them starve? No, but she's thinking, serious you as parent to my children. <laughs> okay. Um, here is a dream about Ron and Hermione wearing crowns. They go off to school, they get on the bus, and, or on the train, and we get introduced to Luna Lovegood and the Quibbler which we find out her father edits. Okay. We also find out Malfoy knows about Sirius because he jokes, Lucius Malfoy does, he jokes about a friend of Harry's dogging around. Okay. Sirius wasn't supposed to go, but he came as the big black dog to see Harry off on the train. Okay. Pages 198-99. Harry sees the Thestrals, which Ron can't see. The skinless, leathery-like flying horses. The things that look like flying horses. And then we get the Sorting Hat's new song. And Harry notices up at the high table, there's a new teacher. It's the one that was one of the Inquisitors. Dolores Jane Umbridge. Okay. Dolores means woeful or sad, like in Rome, the Via Dolorosa, which is the sorrowful way, or in Jerusalem, the Via Dolorosa, the sorrowful way, which is the path Christ took to his crucifixion. Okay. And Umbridge means to take um, anger at something. So the Sorting Hat sings a new song. In times of old when I was new, and we'll finish with this. In times of old when I was new and Hogwarts barely started, the founders of our noble school thought never to be parted. United by a common goal, they had the self-same yearning to make the world's best magic school and pass along their learning. Together we will build and teach, the four good friends decided, and never did they dream that they might someday be divided. 
For were there such friends anywhere as Slytherin and Gryffindor? They seem to be the opposites. Sorting it says, back at the founding, they were best friends. Unless it was the second pair of Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw. So how could it have gone so wrong? How could such friendships fail? Why, I was there and so can tell the whole sad, sorry tale. Said Slytherin. Notice, Slytherin's the one who introduces this idea. We'll teach just those whose ancestry is purest. Said Raven, and I'm not talking about the pure blood idea. Said Ravenclaw, we'll teach those whose intelligence is surest. Said Gryffindor, we'll teach all those with brave deeds to their name. So notice the first three founders. What do they each say? Meaning which? Okay, with Slytherin and with Gryffindor, we get words to modify those. Slytherin, just those. In other words, we'll teach only purebloods. With, Slyther with Gryffindor, we'll teach all those. Okay, Ravenclaw, no modifier. We'll teach those whose. But still, with each one of them, what are they saying? We're going to teach this group of people, or this group of people, or this group of people. In other words, not all of them. Look at Hufflepuff. I'll, okay, each of the other three begin, we, Hufflepuff. I'll teach the lot and treat them just the same. What does the lot mean? I'm going to teach everybody, and I'm going to treat them how? I'm going to treat them all the same. In other words, I'm not going to treat those with purest ancestry as though they're the best. I'm not going to treat those with best intelligence as the best. I'm not going to treat those with brave deeds to their name as the best. She's going to treat them all equally. And she doesn't use that royal we, like she's putting on airs. These differences caused little strife when first they came to light. For each of the four founders had a house in which they might take only those they wanted. So, for instance, Slytherin took only pure-blooded wizards of great cunning, just like him. And only those of sharpest mind were taught by Ravenclaw. While the bravest and the boldest went to Derry and Gryffindor. Good Hufflepuff? What does she do? She takes the last kids to get selected for the sports team in P.E. Meaning what? Who does she take? Bob Yeah. Think of what Dobby tells Harry when he first meets him. The refuse, the outcast, the disconnected, those that nobody else wants. That's who Hufflepuff takes. We'll stop there. We'll pick up with the sorting hat seminar.